I think I heard a ding that live. Ding, ding, live, live. Uh, so we are in the process of embedding the YouTube code in all of the places. Um, so, yeah. Welcome to the chaos of only being allowed to do four hours at a time for 32 hours straight. Woohoo! We can do it. We can do all the things. Yes. So I am embedding YouTube in all the parts of the event. I'm updating the home page on CosmoQuest. We're now on part two. Is really who doesn't want to edit a site that's in production live? Whoops. Well, people watch. <laughs> For those wondering, oh, I am using VI to edit our code. Woohoo! I was eventually won over to VI at some point in grad school because there was a, a Linux laptop out in the field we were using, and the guys would only put VI on it and not Emacs, the Berkeley guys, and so I had no choice. It's fine. Okay. Show so more do options. We have audience? We can't no. tell yet. Okay. Um, so I can see that we're actually live now. There's this crazy actually see us. It seems to be about 70 seconds. Uh, we're not sure why Google has this built in now, but they do. Um, so we're in the process of trying to embed all the things, all the places, let everyone know. We're getting some viewers now. Thank you, guys. Uh, if you're watching, please share this new link this new YouTube link that you are watching on. Uh, new YouTube link for Hangout Quest. We're going to do this every four hours. Goodness gracious. <laughs> Goodness gracious me, oh my. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm also going to be setting up a comment tracker once again so that we can see your comments. Um, so you can comment from YouTube. If you are watching this, I see you guys starting to stream in. So yes, we got comments from you guys already. Thank you so much. Uh, if you can please share this YouTube link. And let's see, we have Hangout. Hashtag. I'm about to add a new hard drive to this. Of uh, Cosmic Castaways during our next segment. Um, so thanks for helping us to get everything out. I'm not going anywhere, but I am going to threaten our entire newscaster desk. <laughs> we have all kinds of things piled up here. It's a good time. Uh, what you're going to be showing is the Cosmic Castaways video. This is a an open source type planetarium show. It's, it's a planetarium show, and it's part of our Science on the Half Sphere uh, segment of CosmoQuest. Um, do you know anything about that? I know it's something Very I've been little, kind of been not working, working on. That side. <laughs> okay, so um, if if you could talk, well, I move the hard drive and I can go explain. for it. I got it. Yeah. So uh, this is a oh, so uh, <laughs> there's comments saying that uh, you went to the loo and we've disappeared. <laughs> Sorry, Paul. Uh, new YouTube link. I'm commenting. Officially shutting down the event that says part one of six, no longer using that. We've put the link to move on to that. Um, but yeah, uh, as far as I, I know, I've not been directly involved in this part, except that uh, Pamela gave me her camera when I went off to Chile, uh, which was very nice to try and take some pictures with the big fisheye lens. And so they've been taking all kinds of photographs around from major observatories and um, creating a planetarium show um, that can be used at any planetarium. Uh, and this is with the Ward Beecher Planetarium at Youngston State University. So we'll actually have that team on in a little bit to talk about the project itself. But first, we're actually going to show you that video. Um, so yeah, good times. All right, so I'm setting up Comment Tracker once again. Like I said, um, if you are uh, moving over with us, thank you. Uh, again, CosmoQuest.org, the little 
blue bar uh, gives you links to all the important places to the contribute or donate page. That is where we can take your donations to keep CosmoQuest uh, programmers fed <laughs> and keep the project running while we look for new funding. Uh, as Stuart and Irene, the, the moon mappers and Mercury mapper scientists were just telling us, uh, you get a lot more science for your buck when you enlist the help of volunteers like you guys. And plus then you guys are contributing to, to the science itself, which is just fantastic. Um, that is so um, something I wish I had more access to when I was young and growing up and wanting to be a scientist when I grew up. Uh, so it's a really great opportunity to engage science um, in real time. So uh, I'm going to keep working. I'm trying to type and talk and that's always, you know, problematic <laughs> um, as I am finding all of our um, comment sources, particularly on Google+. How's it going? Coffee? I'm sure I can use coffee. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I have my, my coffee mug covered in, in Cosmo Quest and My Moon stickers. So. Uh, so. Oh, there it's a strong. <laughs> I don't know if you guys can see that. He wrote strong on the coffee pot. <laughs> it's really cool. Uh, our poor. Significant others are getting dragged along with us, but feeding us coffee, which is fantastic. Yes, Guido, this is kind of like uh, changing reels on a projector. <laughs> Very old school like that. Um, yeah, good times. Uh, yes, I'm hoping we lose our troll. That would be splendiferous. Um, I'm sure this is broadcasting on my page, and so I can find the comment thread that is there. Um, if anyone has uh, experience producing Google Hangouts and may be willing to help us get these things started and produced, uh, that would help us out along the way, I think. Do you want non dairy or real thing? Um, a tiny bit of whatever that is you're holding. <laughs> I, I, I'm, not, I'm not picky. I'm not picky with that. So, um, here be URL, Hangout. CosmoQuest Hangout a fun plus. All right, trying to. I want to get all the comment streams back that we used to have, so I don't miss anything. Because um, you guys have been so super awesome. Um, but yeah, YouTube is a good place to comment. Uh, the Twitter isn't working quite as well, um, but we can keep an eye on that. If you tweet at us at Starstrider or at Noisy Astronomer, uh, chances are it will come and hit us in the face. <laughs> with our Google Glass. <laughs> so uh, be sure to give that a try as well. Um, yeah, I'm not having any luck getting the event page comments in here, but I will try and keep working on that while uh, we get the video set up. Yeah. But uh, the YouTube comments work well, and uh, we are working to get the event page comments back too. Um, if you're watching it from my stream or anything shared from that, that should work too. So hooray. So I'm going to continue my habit of talking in a direction very different from where the camera is because uh, I'm setting things up on my computer. So we're about to have on John Feldmeyer and Patrick Durrell of um, the Ward Beecher Planetarium in Youngstown Department. And we're going to be doing a screening of cosmic castaways. Um, if I can find the video. That's fascinating. The video is not in this directory. Apparently our audio is cutting out here and again. I am typing on the computer that's doing our audio and that may be why it's cutting out. So apologies for that. I'll, I'll stop typing soon. Okay. Do we have Pat and John in the green room? Uh, Tim, I hope you're watching. Uh, can you send along uh, Pat and John? We still have a few minutes, so while I'm working on finding where the video went, the nice thing about being in my own house is I know it's somewhere in the house. Um, we, uh, the Science on the Half Sphere project that we're working on we're trying to create a open source community, open access community, where people can go to collect uh, images, to collect video segments, to get resources they need to produce high quality planetarium shows. Now, um, it's amazing how expensive 
a, a fully rendered um, major production might cost a couple million dollars. And if you're a small town university planetarium, you may not have any money. And so you can't produce something like that. You may not be able to spend the thousands to tens of thousands of dollars necessary to license it to play in your facility. So we want to create things that are high quality science um, and that allow everyday planetariums to be able to get great science out to the masses. So this is what we're doing with Science on the Half Sphere. This is another project of CosmoQuest. Um, and can you share the Science on the Half Sphere screen maybe? Actually, I can share that here while I I'm not seeing, search. I just see your avatar. Yeah, hold on. Your... Let me, so I'm going to share the Science on the Half Sphere web page in a second. I just need to get it open. And this is under the Educate menu on Cosmic We're not Quest. seeing, I'm not seeing it. You will in a second. Okay. I'm not there yet. I'm just, okay. Oh, I see your camera's off. That's why it's just yeah. showing that. <laughs> okay. So um, this is the Science on the Half Sphere. And if you come here, you can get links to the different materials. And we're actually working to put together all of the content so that you can download it. Um, remix it. This is all done under Creative Commons. Um, and it's really kind of awesome. Um, can you blather about images while I try and figure out where the video went? No. What images? Uh, the the uh, lens that you used while you were at Atacama. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, I had a lens, and I, no, I actually really don't have much <laughs> on that. I had no idea what I was doing with your camera, and so everything came out overexposed. Yeah, I got nothing. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, oh, this is going to be that day. Every segment, okay, so I'm just going to stop talking, because when Patrick and uh, uh, John get here, they can tell me where they sent the video, and I can find it while they explain about the video. It's not on the drive? No, it's not. All the stills are on the drive. The, the video's on the drive. Too. It is? Open the folder for their time. Well, which video? Yeah, go back from, go up one directly from that. Um, they should have been in that folder. I put them there. Okay. Hello. Hey. Hi, it's John and Patrick. Hey. Hi, how's it going? Hey. It, hey. It's going fine, except we're having a moment of confusion finding your video. Okay, it's in the Dropbox uh, thingy that we sent you, Pamela. Okay. So, so remember you, yeah, it's on Dropbox, right? So right, so we knew it, it was there. on Dropbox, and then somehow it didn't land on this computer, but I can share that, I can get it, I can get it. All will be well. So while I'm fussing with technology on this end, um, and fussing in a different window um, than the one that science on the half sphere, no, stop multiplying windows of doom. Okay. So why don't you tell us a little bit about where you are in your planetarium. I see that above you and um, more about this project. Sure. Uh, okay, so we're in the Ward Beecher Planetarium, which is in the town of Youngstown, Ohio. And so this is our planetarium. This is the director of our planetarium. Say hi, director. Hi, director. Okay. Um, <laughs> And uh, so as, you know, just like all planetariums, it's a beautiful dome, and we have all sorts of projectors and things. Um, actually, in our planetarium, we have two different kinds of projectors. So yeah, we can sort of stall for Pamela for about a minute and, and talk about what Science on the Hasker actually is. So I'm going to get up and take my earphones off, so I'm going to just yak, and Pat will have to answer any questions. Yes. Okay. So... Behind us here is our planetary projector. This is a star projector, and of course it does the things that all planetariums do. It spreads out the light from this thing onto the dome, and that gets us stars and planets, right? This is uh, what's called a Gotochronos projector. This is sort of a standard projector you'd see in all sorts of planetariums, right? Uh, and so if you've gone to a planetarium, there's something that looks like a big bug-eye thing in the center of a planetarium. Okay, but if we lower this, so this is going to get noisy, so Nicole might want to actually mute this. Okay. All right. Pat, you're laughing at me. All right. I'm so ready in case it's too We also have two other things. Okay, yeah. 
This is what's called an optomechanical projection, right? Because it's basically just a lot of light bulbs shining up onto the dome, giving you the stars and the planets. But if we lower this into the ground, goodbye, Kronos. We can't even hear it here, so we're good. You see we have another box behind it. This is a digital planetary projector. And you know, it looks a lot simpler because all it is is a big computer. And on the top, there's a fisheye lens that projects the light in all directions. And so that lets us do shows not just of stars and galaxies. It lets us do a full dome movie or animation. Okay? And so we have things like that. <laughs> the door got stuck. All right, so you have these, you can show these films, okay, in all directions, and a lot of planetariums have one of these things too. The problem is those shows are very expensive because they're professionally done. They cost usually thousands of dollars to make. Uh, well, actually, they cost millions of dollars to make in some cases. And so as a result, lots of planetariums have problems keeping up with all their shows. All right, so I'm going to try not to kill myself on the internet. <laughs> Good, no injuries. I win. All right. That was so, the first rule of thumb, no yeah, injuries. The first rule is no injuries. So there's lots of planetariums like this that you know, have very limited budgets, but you know they would like to get new shows. You don't want to keep showing the same show over and over and over again. And so there's always this need to create more all-dome shows. And what Science on the Half Sphere is about is about getting content out to different planetariums around the world, but also to get content to normal people, because of course anything we make for one of these shows can also be used by normal people. Yeah, what did and, I mean that? And it's more than just planetarium shows. It, it's also, uh, Pat and I have both in, invested in fisheye lenses that allow a greater than 180 degree field of view and um, he, he'll be talking about this later in a different segment. Yep. Um, it, it's allowing us to get imagery that can be used and I'd love to hear more about that because this is just like one of those random ideas that I think came out of um, talking between why we were actually together for an official meeting. Right. Yeah, well one of the things is, I mean, it, Astronomy is uh, is a rapidly changing field, and you like again as John mentioned, you just don't want to you don't want to just get one show and then have it use use it time and time again. You want to be able to show people all the really interesting things. I mean, many people are familiar with astronomy picture of the day, and a lot of the beautiful imagery that is in astronomy. And so one of the nice things would be to you know then create our own content, our own fisheye images that people could use. Uh, they could either you know use them to look at themselves, or they could uh, Put them in their own shows and then use these images to create their own material for their own planetarium. So, so science in the half sphere sort of was, you know, started off with the idea of making shows, but was also what about other content and make it freely available to people so that they could uh, see the wonder of things. Because you know, astronomy is a wonderful thing, and with fi with the fisheye lens and the full dome, you now have this immersive experience and. Uh, so the thing that I think helps really sell astronomy with all the, the beautiful imagery, uh, you can now do full dome, and I think that's a, a really nice thing to be able to do. I agree completely. That was no help for you. <laughs> um, so so um, the, the really so what we did um, to start off this project is uh, we actually approached Pamela a few years ago. I was looking this up. Pamela it was. January 2011 at one of the oh, wow. American Astronomical Society meetings. And yeah, it's been a while, hasn't it? Um, and the idea was to put a show together about some of the scientific research that I do and Dr. Durrell does, Pat does, and make it into a planetarium show. And the idea is that this is not a topic that other people would do. We decided there are companies out there that do shows, and many of them are very good. Oh, I don't yeah. want to make it sound like we're knocking them. But they do certain kinds of shows. For example, they do shows about the solar system. So we decided to do a show about the solar system would be silly because you know some of these programs have Hollywood stars and million dollar budgets and I don't have Liam Neeson on my speed dial. So um, 
what we decided to do was do a show that was sort of off the beaten path a little bit, but one that other people could use. And the first show we've done, which is now complete, is called Cosmic Castaways. And it's basically a short, you know, 20-minute movie about how you can find stars outside of galaxies. That's the research topic that Dr. that Pat Durrell and I work on. And so the idea is the show's done, and Pamela did the voice for it, and we did a lovely job. Lead vocals. Lead vocals. Um, yeah, Pat plays the drums. Um, I play bass. Um, and the idea is that, you know, now the show's done, so it's going to go out to planetariums across the world. It's also, because it's fairly, it's a digital show, it's also up on YouTube, you know, right now. If people want to watch the show later on, they can go to YouTube and type Cosmic Castaways and it'll come up. After all the Star Trek episodes. Yes, after all the Star Trek <laughs> episodes. Thank you, Kurt. That was helpful. Okay. So, uh, did I stall long enough? I, I, I think you did. I, I think we are ready to go. Um, we had a corrupt file on the first go, so I'm going to try and stream it through the web player. I won't be able to tell if there's sound immediately, so let me know if there's issues. Actually, can you hear this? Can you hear the volume button? Uh, I heard a little bump. I don't see a little green line. No. Um, okay. Do you set it in sound settings and in yeah. the Hangout settings? You might be able to just play the YouTube no, video. That's oh, the problem. I forgot to hit save on the microphone, I think. Save. Why won't you go to Soundflower? OK, let's try Soundflower 2 channel instead. This is the problem I had <laughs> on okay. the other computer. Hold on. Redoing the window. Oh, goodness gracious. OK, so yeah, we're going to try that again. <laughs> OK, sure. Can, can you tell us a little bit about your personal backgrounds, your professional backgrounds? Uh, sure. Uh, you want to start first? Yeah. Uh, I'm an associate professor of astronomy at uh, Youngstown State University. Uh, uh, I've been here for eight years now, and uh, I'm one of these people who, uh, you know, started as a kid, got a chance to look through a telescope when I was like seven, eight years old, and had the astronomy bug ever since. So, you know, it, it's, it's been a fun thing for me, and it, it's really kind of a nice thing that I went through the system, I got my degrees, and, you know, get to play professor. And uh, so I get to do this for a living, and it's a lot of fun because it's, uh, you know, it's not just the doing research, it's being able to teach, teach this to people and to be involved with projects and to bring it to people, which is why, you know, we're both so excited to be part of CosmoQuest because, you know, the idea is, you know, a lot of people want to hear about the kind of things that we do. I'm always frustrated when people say, oh, scientists want to keep things from people. No, we want to tell people. <laughs> you can't keep us back. Yeah, yeah, we want to tell people what we do. We, you know, so I always found that rather interesting when I hear people say that. It's like, no, we, 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 we like to think we do interesting things, and and uh, Cosmic Castaways is, you know, born of that idea. So we want people to see, oh yeah, there, are, you know, these, these people uh, a little bit crazy, but there are these people. They made the show and they do this kind of research, and we want to bring it to everybody. And and so that's the key thing, I think. This yes. is for research. This is for you research. Are both research faculty getting time on the Hubble Space Telescope in some cases. Yes. You, you aren't science educators. You aren't science communicators. You are faculty uh, tenured. You're, you're doing the hardcore job. And yes. you're finding the time along the way to carve out um, your ability to do these planetarium shows as well. And so yes. you're taking your research and making it public in the most amazing way possible. And I think we're now ready to show the video, so I'm going to cut to the video. There are places where the night sky has no constellations. No Orion, no Big Dipper, nothing but a few lonely faraway stars and a few faint ghostly patches of light.
Most stars lie within the crowded boundaries of galaxies, traveling with their brothers and sisters in a vast galactic family. But some find themselves on their own, deep within the voids between the galaxies. These are the cosmic castaways. <laughs> Where? I'm gonna try that again. <laughs> I I hit a I hit a key by accident. Hold on. <laughs> Should we do the director's commentary or something? Or Go for it. Know? You're always welcome to do the director's commentary. Oh, your own, no, your no own your, your voice is much nicer. Than yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, we never got around to making a gag reel for the movie, unfortunately. Um, the universe is full of stars. Some are huge, hundreds of times the size of the sun. Others are tiny, barely larger than the familiar planet Jupiter. They come in a wide variety of colors, from the deepest red to dazzling blue. Most of these stars lie within galaxies, huge collections of stars, gas, dust, and dark matter that include our own Milky Way in their number. Galaxies are held together by the force of gravity, just as gravity keeps the planets of our solar system orbiting around us now. Gravity from all of the mass inside our Milky Way galaxy keeps stars orbiting its center. Our own sun majestically circles the center of the Milky Way. The Milky Way is so large that the last time the sun was at its current position, the first dinosaurs roamed the Earth. just as our solar system, is one of many in our Milky Way galaxy. Our Milky Way is just one of a myriad of galaxies. Galaxies do not exist alone. They are found in groups, held together by the same gravity that keeps their stars in orbit. Our Milky Way lies in a small galaxy group known as the local group, which contains a handful of large galaxies and dozens of small galaxies. As galaxies move within galaxy groups, sometimes wandering too close to one another, they can tug at each other through the force of gravity. These gravitational forces cause colossal changes to the shapes of the galaxies. Since this process takes place over hundreds of millions of years, astronomers cannot watch it from beginning to end. Their telescopes only catch snapshots in time of different galaxies seen at different stages of this interaction sequence. With tools like the Hubble Space Telescope, dozens of these interacting galaxies have been imaged in amazing detail.
from what they've seen, astronomers have created computer simulations to show how galaxies change their shapes. As the galaxies approach, gravity rips the stars out of their normal paths, and some are pulled out of the galaxies into long tail-like structures. Even though there are billions of stars in each galaxy, the distances between the individual stars are vast, so they rarely, if ever, collide with other stars. Instead, the two galaxies eventually merge together to form a new, more massive galaxy as their torn-off tails drift away. The remaining stars, floating within these abandoned tails, are forever stranded in the vast space between the galaxies. This sort of collision is rare in small groups like our own local group. But as we look beyond our home group, we encounter much larger collections of galaxies called galaxy clusters. These immense systems are some of the largest structures in the universe and contain thousands of galaxies. If the local group is like a small village of galaxies, Galaxy clusters are like a big city, crowded and busy. In galaxy clusters, the interactions between galaxies are much more common because the galaxies are crammed so close together. Computer simulations show us that in these dense environments, many more stars will be gravitationally torn from their homes and left in the cosmic void. As we study these giant clusters, we witness numerous galaxies interacting with one another at the same time. Sometimes, long tails of stars are wrenched from galaxies during their too close passages. Other times, the interactions produce fan-shaped plumes of castaways. One by one, gravity continually pries stars from their galactic homes until 10 to 20% of the galaxy's stars are castaways, lost in the voids between the galaxies. Let's pay a visit to a typical star in one of these galaxies. This star formed billions of years ago in a cloud of gas and dust and orbits near the edge of a spiral galaxy. The star has a slightly lower temperature than our yellow-white sun, so it appears orange. But this star's long journey around its galaxy is not uneventful. Its galaxy and the star's own orbit around the galaxy are disturbed when an unwelcome neighbor comes for a visit. The intruder galaxy distorts the spiral galaxy and our star is hurled from its home along with many other stars as they are stretched out to form an enormous tidal tail. But the tail is fragile. Eventually, these stars will be scattered from gravitational pokes and prods of the other galaxies within the cluster like a leaf torn from its tree in a windstorm. While evicted from its home, the star itself was not damaged and its planet orbit around it as they always had, oblivious to the large-scale chaos around them.
the lost star and all its fellow castaways seems to be absent from our image. Like smoke from a fire disappearing in the wind, the light of the ghostly tidal tales has faded into the cosmic background as it spreads over tremendous distances. The starlight from these cosmic castaways is now so diffused that it is much, much fainter, a hundred times fainter than the dark moonless night sky, making their light almost invisible. Too many other lights shine brighter than these castaways, and so they are all but lost in the glare of our busy universe. But they are not lost. It wasn't until the late 20th century that astronomers had the tools they needed to search for these elusive objects. The most promising place to seek the light of these castaways is the nearby Virgo cluster of galaxies, the nearest galaxy cluster to Earth. It is about 55 million light years away and contains several thousand galaxies. Using a special telescope designed to search for this very faint light, astronomers spent months observing the center of the Virgo cluster to search for its cosmic castaways. At first, the telescope saw only the bright galaxies in Virgo, as well as some stars from our own Milky Way in the foreground. But, as it looked longer, probing deeper, an intricate web of tails and fans came into view in the space between the galaxies. This stunning image is a snapshot of the history of the Virgo cluster. In this long exposure, the light of the cosmic castaways is able to shine visibly in the spaces between galaxies. There is another way to see cosmic castaways, by observing the individual stars directly. This is only possible for the brightest castaway stars because galaxy clusters are so far away. The most abundant of these bright stars are the majestic red giants. Our cosmic castaways journey lasted billions of years. Over this time, it has swelled to several hundred times its original size and cooled, becoming a red giant star. Now, in the darkness far from its original home, it is nearing the end of its life. Because of the star's enormous size, it is also very bright, several thousand times brighter than our sun, making it visible to powerful telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope. As bright as the red giant is, it is very far away, so it will be very faint even to the Hubble Space Telescope. Here is an image of one piece of the Virgo cluster. Zooming in, we find a faint sprinkling of red objects. These are individual red giant castaways, peers to the star that we have followed, each of them lost forever between the galaxies. So that ended a bit abruptly. Was that where it was supposed to end? You guys need to unmute yourselves up in the top right, the little microphone button. Sorry about that. And, and we apologize to everyone watching that Nicole and I spontaneously started gorging ourselves. Um, we had the realization we hadn't eaten for a long time, and so we decided to eat while the video was playing. <laughs> well, I guess I guess at this point we could add, you know, with, with donations we can finish the show. <laughs> 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 and I got a coffee mug. So I, I think there somehow it got a glitch at some point. We test played it, and then when I went to download it uh, during the chaos at the beginning of this, I got a glitch. And, and so um, we apologize to everyone out there. You can watch the video in its entirety on YouTube. It's already posted yeah. out there. That's right. Um, 
So go ahead. Oh, oh no. Okay. I mean, uh, we could talk about the end of the show, or we could talk about how it was made, or we could talk about how important Cosmo Quest is for the show. <laughs> Which one would you like us to talk about? Um, so, so why don't you at least give the punchline to the show so people know how it ends in yeah. sorrow for the little yeah. orange star. Uh, yeah, so the, the poor little orange star swells up, becomes a red giant star. It's detected with the Hubble Space Telescope and then ultimately like all stars, it will you know, end its life and the material will be spread out into outer space. Uh, the one really interesting thing that we learned about when we were making this video and doing this research is there's a small chance, not a big chance, but about a 10-15% chance that in the future when the Milky Way galaxy runs into the Andromeda galaxy and they go by each other, there's actually a small chance that the sun might be cast out as a castaway. Now that's not the most likely scenario for the sun, but it is a possible scenario. And so there's actually a small chance that eventually the sun will become one of these cosmic castaways. Yeah, many billions of years in the future. Yeah, in other words, don't worry about it. Yeah. Don't sell your house. Well, yeah. you know, it might be a good thing uh, if we're cast out of that we can get a better view of all the star formation and, and the, the AGN, the active galactic nucleus that'll wake up. So we don't want to yeah. be too close to that action. Yeah, no, that's entirely true. So, so getting different. scattered a little ways out is probably a good thing. The views would be fantastic. It would be an amazing <laughs> view for us astronomers. I'm jealous of my ancestors. Yeah, 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 yeah. My ancestors. Descendants. Descendants, <laughs> yes. yes. Um, so, so Science on the Half Sphere is a project that is a collaboration uh, with Ward Bleacher Planetarium, working with CosmoQuest, and it's going to allow us to hopefully continue to make shows like this. We have some sketched out on paper. We just need to get the funding to do them. That's right. um, yep. If we get the funding we need today, that pays for our staff here at SIUE to do everything we need to do uh, for a planetarium show associated with whatever our next citizen science project is. And um, we want to create content that can be played in the small science centers that are scattered all across the United States that need free content like this. Um, so what, what's it like for you guys who are one of those small centers? Is this something that if, if you weren't already the ones building it, you'd, you'd love to utilize? Uh, I would say definitely. I mean, normally for, for us, and we're in kind of better shape than most very small planetariums, is that we have a, a permanent staff um, you know, who actually helped a great deal with the show. For example, Kurt Spivey, who's off camera, but come in, Kurt say hi to the internet. Kurt, Kurt, come get on camera for a you second. Know, you're, you're not on camera. Oh, on camera. Yeah, say hello. Light. Hello. Hi. Right. And there's Annie, who's fabulous as well. Yeah, so, I mean, we're, we're actually more fortunate than the average plant that we have a staff and we have some you know resources but even at our best we can maybe get one new show a year right that's sort of the the budget level that we have and there are many places that are you know kind of below us so having a set of content that, that is up to date scientifically is still pretty nice and can be shown to the public is I think a real benefit to planetariums but of course, because these shows are digital, as we said, like you know, a lot of people will see this not on a planetarium dome, but they'll see it on YouTube, and that so that means that the work you do on a show sort of counts double, and that's a big thing. It, it is because there's a lot, yeah, like I said, I mean, there's uh, certainly uh, you know, over a th it, well over a thousand planetaria around the world that have this full dome technology and could make use of shows like this. And again, you know, one of the nice things about uh, being from a smaller place, and, and uh, this this show sort of, if you want, focuses on on a niche uh, project, on a niche research that you know many of the other companies aren't going to do. I mean, we certainly weren't expecting anybody else to be working on a show about you know intercluster stars or intergalactic stars. So it's kind of like, well, you know, it's something we find interesting. We think other people would find it interesting, and uh, you know, so it'd be, a, I think, a, a neat show that other people could get a, a chance to use. It's and captivating. there are more ideas. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff in astronomy. You know, almost every astronomer worth oh, yeah. anything can talk about something really interesting, and even other astronomers will be like, oh, I've never heard of that before. Um, I remember years ago, um, uh, this is not me, but my advisor was explaining 
so what's your student doing? He's looking for stars outside of galaxies. And there was this little pause on the phone. He goes, oh, that's so cool. Right? You know, I didn't know they happened that way. Right? Astronomy is filled with all these stories. Um, and, and so be able to tell some of the stories that are not so well known in the form of a show, not just our stuff, but other people's stuff, is something that I think is really um, rewarding to both Pat and myself. Yeah, well, because we, you know, like I said, I mean, uh, we, we are research astronomers, but we love being able to communicate, to be able to communicate these, uh, this stuff to the public. I mean, it's, uh, it's fun. I mean, I yeah. mean, first and foremost, astronomy is fun, even, you know, even though we get to play research professor, you know, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun, and uh, shows like this, uh, you know, hopefully carry some of that along. It's neat stuff. There's a lot of wonderful things out there. And like I said, there's lots of things in astronomy that, you know, a lot of people, you know, again, solar system and black holes, you know, there are the classic topics out there. But, you know, there are lots of ones that, you know, we or other astronomers, uh, you know, Pamela and Nicole for sure, you know, you guys can come up with all sorts of neat ideas that no one else is really touching that would probably make a really good show. And uh, one, one of the things that we're hoping to do is whatever citizen science project we take on next, we want to do the story of the public engagement as a planetarium show so it teaches the science and one of the ideas we've been kicking around is is we're working on the Vesta Mappers project and we will be NASA funding willing, mission success willing, doing another edition of Asteroid Mappers starting in 2015 when Dawn gets to series and we want to tell the story of how have everyday people been part of discovering asteroids? How is it that Ceres stopped being a planet? Um, it, it was a planet once and then they realized it was actually part of the belt and they demoted it. Pluto you know, wasn't. Ceres complaining. Yeah, Ceres doesn't complain. Why is everyone? Yeah. Um, but it's we want to tell Ceres. that story. And yeah. if, if we do the radio astronomy project, we want to tell the story of Grota Reba. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many stories that are captivating, but they're not sexy, so they don't get the big headlines. But I know I was brought to astronomy by the small things, by I love variable stars, they're puzzles, and I love the history behind them. And so I want to work with you guys out there at the Ward Beecher Planetarium, um, with, with your staff, Curtis and Annie as well, to bring these captivating small stories to the giant dome. So is there a, a way that planetarium planetaria <laughs> planetaria the show can contact you guys to um, get the show? Well, so that's actually you know what what CosmoQuest does for us, right? Um, you know, personally, is that we you know the infrastructure of getting all of the getting this stuff out to planetaria is tricky because unfortunately planetariums are not plug and play. They you know. Um, they're really not plug and play. They have many different formats and many different digital projectors. And one of the things that CosmoQuest is giving us is a place to host all the different, you know, basically flavors of the show, right? In the old days, it'd be VHS, Betamax, DVD, right? But so all these planetariums that, you know, were bought a number of years ago can play the show for free. And so CosmoQuest, you know, that's not an inf uh, you know, internet infrastructure that you can just kind of whip up. And, and so what CosmoQuest does for us is, besides you know, having Pamela's voice and expertise, we actually can put the stuff up on the Science on the Half Sphere part of CosmoQuest, and Planetary will be able to download all the information. So yeah. if you go to our website, in this case, CosmoQuest.org slash blog slash science on the half, half sphere. sphere. It's under the Educate tab. So just click on Educate, drop down. It's much easier than typing all that in. Yeah. So here's um, our science on the half sphere. There's also science on the half sphere. <laughs> That's it's awesome. Just, we, we spared no expense. Yes. See, this is a half sphere. And yeah. That, yeah, this is called dynamic range in astronomy. We showed, start off the show with a, with a half million dollar uh, uh, star projector, and, and then we, we go to this. So That's called dynamic range. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have other toys in case things get boring. So, so, so if you go to the the Science on the Half Sphere website, um, on the right side there is a media tab. You can uh, click over to the Cosmic Castaways. You can see the complete dome. Um, 
you can see, sorry, you can see the complete show in MPEG, in MOV. You can download the soundtrack with narration. And currently it says complete Dome Masters, 22 gigabytes are available upon request. We have those uploaded. We're tr still trying to figure out how to link everything in. Um, but everything we do is going to be available here. Right. And yes. our goal is to make it easy for anyone out there who is either using Blender to create their own shows, uh, just wants to download a readily done show, uh, we have it all for you. So come check it out and become part of sharing the science. Yep. I mean, one of the things we hope to do is, of course, we've now gained a little bit of knowledge about how to do these shows. And for people who are interested in making their own shows, I mean, we're, we're, we're not doing this for the money. In fact, uh, you know, this show was funded by, uh, you know, the National Science Foundation. Thank you, NSF, your tax yes. dollars at work. Yes, thank um, you. Yes, um, and, and so we're going to put up, you know, how we made the show for people who are interested or in a small planetarium, maybe by themselves, and want to put together a show of their own. And we can you know, give people recommendations on what we found works and what doesn't. Did that leave anything out there? Yeah, well, it, 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 I, I will add that Science and Nasty is more than just Joe's. I mean, again, uh, uh, Pamela mentioned, you know, the uh, photography, you know, having still images that people can use and incorporate them in their own shows so that they can make their own personalized programs within their own planetaria. Uh, that's something we'll talk about uh, tomorrow morning. Yeah, so we'll talk about how Pat risked his life for about 10 nights. <laughs> but he got to go to Mauna Kea. I went and, to Mauna Kea, yes. yes. And, and we're slowly working to get more people helping us with the imagery. So Warren Schultz, uh, who's a photographer some of you may know from Google+, Plus, um, he and his significant other are going to be going to Europe this summer, and they're going to be going to all the nerd safe havens throughout Europe. Uh, capturing the awesome clocks, capturing the awesome universities, and they're taking a uh, matched lens to the ones that Pat and I have, and they're going to try and capture some more places. And you do have the uh, images from Chile at the Atacama Large Millimeter Ray. I just don't know how well they came out. So. Yeah, I, will, I need to work on those. I will dump them at you. Oh, I really, I no I really would like to. See, I would really like to see those. Well, I mean, photography is a hobby for me as well, so it's one of those things. I learned a lot of how to do fisheye photography at 14,000 feet on Mauna Kea, so. so. Don't try this at home, boys. Don't try this at home, yeah. Yeah, no, I was at 16,000 yeah. feet. In Chile, yes. And, and your brain just stops. I had this yes. great conversation with Matt Kaplan, who will be on the show later, and maybe <laughs> maybe we'll save it for then, but yeah, okay. your brain stops. <laughs> you get, you get it's very true. fuzzy. Yeah, so. Do you, um, do you guys have a, we have a question from Guido Bibra. Um, what mm. is the future look like for planetarium projectors? They're going to be all digital projectors soon. Uh, or is it going back to the analog Zeiss projectors, I which are famous in Europe? No, I think they're going mostly digital because there's the convenience and the ability. I mean, I mean, five, six years ago, the early uh, digital projectors, I mean, they did not have the resolution. I mean, you could, you could take an optomechanical projector like our Chronos here. Uh, and compare it to a digital sky, and the optomechanical beat it hands down. Now it's getting a little bit closer, and of course with digital, there's all sorts of things you can do, not just you know making shows, but doing you know uh, real time things, fly throughs through the solar system into a into a, ga a gas nebula. That didn't make any sense. Into a nebula, you know. So there's a lot of things that uh, that can be done. So. Um, so I think I think planetaria are moving in that direction, but I mean one of the reasons we have both in our planetarium is that you know we still like the classic sky that an optical mechanical projector shows. I mean this projector here still gives you a very wonderful and realistic look at what the night sky is, and if you know you've got a lot of people coming in who don't know the sky and don't know the constellations, it does a fantastic job. So you know we purposely a few years ago went with both. So. And, and yeah. what's amazing with some of the digital ones is I, I know the planetarium um, at University of Colorado Boulder, you can actually go in with binoculars and resolve binary what? stars. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Actually, I think our projector, I think some of the star clusters you can resolve you can with. You yeah. definitely see the star clusters in the Magellanic Clouds, which is so pretty wild. Just the fact that you can <laughs> use binoculars in a useful yeah, manner. Yes. Oh in a yeah. I've yeah. never heard of that. And yeah. that, that higher res, that requires the digital precision, and it's 
truly, truly awesome. So it, so it is, but the, 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 the really the thing is, is that it's only now that you know some digital projectors are getting to that point where they can start to rival. But that's only been recently. I mean, like I said, five years ago, it wasn't even close. I mean, a, a, a traditional classic uh, star projector, optomechanical, would do it, would have done a better job. Well, I mean, I, I think it's safe to say that th this is actually kind of controversial in the planetarium sure. community, right? Is is that different? All the planetariums are the same. You know, are different. They yeah. have different setups and different budgets. And uh, it's sort of like, do you like your music on MP3 or vinyl, right? You could get a very hot debate between lots of people on Google Plus about this. Yeah. Um, you notice we like both of them. Yeah. And and we wanted we, the best of both. We we use both routinely in our planetarium shows. Um, and, and so, you know, there was a reason why we set the, you know, actually I didn't set it up, he set it up that way, is to split the difference um, and, and make sure that we had, you know, the maximum capability for what we had. And th this is one, one thing that I can't stress enough, enough is everything you guys do at Ward Beecher Planetarium is free. Yes, you yes. you people come in they they don't have to pay admission so if a little kid wants to go see a planetarium show his parents can take him and it's never a matter of cost uh, it's a great air conditioned way to escape a hot Ohio evening uh, you guys are tornado savvy so you're good there um, go weather out the storms or weather out a hot day in a planetarium show and then the things that you produce are distributed for free and this is kind of what we try and do with all of CosmoQuest is we just want to learn we just want to teach we want to give everything away and and so we are building this community of people that um, we are pushing ourselves to the limits what I also love is the um, number of hats all of us wear. Uh, so here I am, PhD astronomer, uh, hacking the website code because those are skills I had to develop to do large database science. Um, I do narration and write. Uh, Pat and, and John are research astronomers teaching classes, running the planetarium setup, helping to, to put together the um, we just had a coffee accident, and it's the it's awesome. Not. Okay, so this oh, is no. Steve Trulio's coffee. He is just to put a shout out. He does my show, um, and he donated coffee to us. You can it's go to Facebook.com/slash It's My Show. Um, plug for the coffee. Um, but uh, so so you guys are are learning about all of the rendering, all of the acquiring the images. We're wearing as many hats as possible, and by wearing many hats, we're stress, stretching our funding as far as possible. And uh, that's exactly right. <laughs> that's yeah, actually, the coffee. yeah, actually, I should tell a funny story about funding in this show. Is that originally we, you know, we had a budget for the show, and, and the NSF said great, and you know, our staff was so good that they actually came in under budget, mm. and yeah. uh, the the hilarious thing about that is that. Actually, after a while, the NSF wants you to spend all of the money, and so then you had to fill out extra paperwork to extend the grant one more year and buy more <laughs> stock. So we were apparently too frugal. I'm I'm sorry, um, but you know we will we will use that money to get the show out as many different ways as possible. Um, I mean, there are even our planetariums that uh, want the show in uh, not full dome format, but like DVD format. Yeah, reg yeah regular stuff. Just playing DVD, and yeah. so we'll be delivering that to you know whatever planetarium wants it. Yeah, again, we want we we think what we you know this kind of research is interesting. A lot of our colleagues think it's very interesting. We want other people to enjoy it. So uh, you know, free show and uh, learn the science that goes along with it. And the plan is for more to come. Yep. Uh, whether it's distant galaxies, Grove Reaver, uh, globular clusters, uh, a passion of mine, you know. Yeah, so well, we have about we've got all have sorts of five, ideas. Five shows in the pipeline, I think, that are sort of serious ideas in the sense that we have a, you know, we don't have a full script yet, but we, if somebody handed us money, we would start working on them. Right, Annie and Kirk, who are, who are laughing behind. Laughing at us. <laughs> and oh, and don't worry, I got plenty to do. <laughs> yeah. 
Kurt says and he's got plenty to do. Yeah, I know. One of the awesome things about CosmoQuest is the role students get to play in this, and that that hasn't come up yet. But Joe, who's our number two programmer, mm -hmm. he's a grad student. Annie, who's working there at Word Bleacher, she's an undergraduate. I think Annie did massive amounts of the design and rendering for Cosmic Castaways, and I know Joe does all of our front end JavaScript for CosmoQuest. So we're providing students the chance to do uh, professional work on the job, paying them. Joe's getting a tuition waiver from the university. So your dollars donated to pay Joe's salary. Um, our university turns around and when I pay his salary, they pay his tuition. So you're helping pay for people to go to college. Um, Annie's salary to do these planetarium shows. We're stretching every dollar as far as we can to share things and just do great things as we can. Sorry, I'm trying to bring someone into our green room, so I'm multitasking like a fiend here. Um, Michael, if you're watching, or Tim, if you're watching, you can pass this on. Um, have him ping Pamela. I'm in the process of adding right now. Okay, yeah, I don't know if that's the email address that'll work, so let's see. Okay, we'll thing. find out. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Doing all the things. Um, so we have to give a shout out, I think, to Astronomy FM. But before we do that, although I think I already did it, um, <laughs> John, Patrick, do you, do you have any parting comments uh, that you want to share out? Um, go. Um, I guess the the one thing I want to say is uh, this was sort of our first baby, as it were. I mean, th this is the first show that we've done this way. And I think we've learned a lot. Um, and I honestly think now um, we can do even more stuff. I mean, that's sort of the nice thing is that with um, what we've learned about and with having you know, CosmoQuest sort of backstopping us, I think we will be able to uh, do more shows on more interesting stuff. And I, you know, we're really, really optimistic about the future because there's a lot of different things we can do for honestly not that much resources, right? I mean. The, the entire show, just for anyone's knowledge, was about ten or fifteen thousand dollars. And um, these shows, if we do them well, will be useful for years to come. And so I'm actually really optimistic about this, and we're really glad to be working with CosmoQuest about it. Yeah, go CosmoQuest. Where do you want to go? Indeed, it's also not just uh, for everyone else there, uh, out there watching, but uh, for us. Where do we want to go? This is a, a very nice direction for us. It's a lot of fun working with everybody. Uh, had a lot of fun working with uh, Chris Mihos, who also worked on the project, and uh, and of course Pamela and everybody over at CosmoQuest. So, so uh, we get to do new things too. It's not uh, you know, so it's uh, it's fun for everybody. Yeah, yeah, we had a lot of fun. Yes, it's, fun it's, for the whole astro. Yeah, yes, right, yeah, yeah, it's good for everybody. <laughs> it's we're we're lucky enough to get to love the people that we work with, love the things that we do, and. Um, we want to keep doing it, and uh, we need your help right now. Um, yeah. That thingy. Wait, wait. <laughs> yes, there's. Can't make it go. Uh, <laughs> there's donate link on the screen down there. Yeah. So <laughs> cosmoquest.org/donate and help us keep doing what we're doing with the folks over at War Beach or Planetarium. Uh, and we will keep. I will keep narrating shows. We will keep generating science, generating planetarium show ideas, hosting the content, and helping get it out there for free. Mm -hmm. So thank you, John, Pat. We will see you again tomorrow when we talk about the Image Project. This yes. has been discussing cosmic castaways. Go check it out on YouTube. Share the link out. Let's get everyone learning this wonderfully captivating story of how stars can get lost in the spaces between the galaxies. Not all science is explosive. Um, sometimes it's just beautiful. Aww. Absolutely. Thanks. That was a beautiful end panel. That thank was great. You. So thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Have fun, guys. Have, have we'll a see good one. On flip side. Okay. Goodbye. Bye now. Mm. Okay. What do we um?